We are still in period three, but now we are at unit seven, 1754 to 1800, and we're gonna look at the country from George Washington through Thomas Jefferson. I'm not asking you to memorize anything on this page. I just find it astounding that we went um, through so many changes and became an actual real country in such a short amount of time. So I thought this timeline might help you also see that. So Jamestown 1607, Plymouth 1620, and you see all the things that happened to this country in between. And by 1789, we have George as our first president and we are truly for the first time a nation independent. Let's take a look at our very first president, George. Uh, George was asked to serve in 1789, and he sets many precedents, not to be confused with presidents. Precedents means he was the guy who kind of started these traditions. And um, one of the first questions asked was, what do we call this guy? We don't want it to sound kingly. Um, and so it was George himself who came up with the idea of Mr. President. And he felt that that was, um, it sounded like a, like a common man, Mr. So he was very adamant that he not uh, seem in any way like a king or the fact that he was trying to be a king. He wanted to keep it so he was just another person in America. And so his the name became Mr. President. You know, at the time, people wore wigs, and one of the number one reasons that they wore wigs was because everybody had lice. And George was one of those people that wore a wig, but once he became president, he still wore a wig often, but it was a, um, a much uh, smaller wig. Uh, back then, the, the taller your wig was, the more prominent a figure, more powerful you were, because it was the more expensive wigs that kind of poofed up when you cleaned them. And so if you were rich, your wig was pretty poofy. But George did not want to be poofy because he was afraid that from afar, somebody in a crowd might think he actually had something on his head and interpret it as he's trying to be a king. He wouldn't even wear a hat, which was also a tradition during, during that time period. But he refused to wear anything on his head while he was president. He also is the guy who came up with the idea of creating a, a little place just for our capital. He didn't want our capital to be in any one state because it would be possibly misconstrued that that state had more power than any of the others. And so rather than saying, you, Maryland, you can have it, or Virginia, you can have it, he created the the District of Columbia and that's where our capital is. He also uh, realized that he should not rule by himself, that that might actually be misinterpreted as, you know, he's trying to be a, um, a king, uh, even an absolute ruler. And so he created the idea of having a cabinet or a set of advisors to help him, uh, to guide him. He also decided that no president should ever have more than a two-term uh, presidency. And he put that limit on him on himself. He was asked to run again in 1797 and refused because he said, you know, you're making it seem like my uh, presidency can go on forever. And I really think after two terms and, you know, eight years ruling the country, that after that, it does seem, seem like, a king and so he set that term limit on himself we don't actually have that as a real law until FDR comes along many years later um, and dies in his fourth term and then we make that and we uh, make that a uh, an amendment but he is the one who who said I will not serve more than two he also established the idea of saying goodbye, basically, the presidential farewell, and every president does this. And in his speech, it's it's very prevalent in our time period because one of the final things he said was a warning to our nation not to allow the creation of political parties. He felt like it would be the end of our nation. And I never believed he was right until I've seen how badly the Republicans and the Democrats behave towards one another nowadays. And, and and, you know, it took a while, but I think old George was probably right. I do want to make a little side note here that other than the fact that George was one of the very few famous people alive during this time period, and so that kind of made him the obvious choice as president, um, he also had another thing going for him that uh, most men of his age would not, and that is the fact that he did not have any of his own children. He had some stepchildren. Um, Martha, his wife, had been married before and had children, but 
that he got smallpox when he was a young man and could not father children because of that. And that sounds horrible, but it actually made him a better candidate for, for the presidency. The reason being is he had no heirs to hand this position off to. So you, you've studied lots about kings and queens across the world and what is the natural recourse when one of them passes away, their eldest child, usually the son, will take their place. But George doesn't have any, any children at all, alone enough a son. So that's not going to be able to happen in his case. So it seems it makes him more attractive as the very first president of the United States that there is no line for him to pass his presidency down to. Now, it's not like everybody was madly in love with George and uh, never acted out or questioned him. He had some problems, and he is the first. So some of the th problems are just because he's the first. And one of them is, how do you get the judiciary branch? How do you pick the people that are going to serve on it? We can't elect everybody because before you know it, you would be doing nothing but electing people. And so he created the um, Judiciary Act of 1789, and this is where the president selects the judges that serve on the, on the Supreme Court, and then Congress can either approve or deny that selection. And so there are three layers to a federal court, district, circuit, and supreme. So if you don't like what happens at the district court level, you don't like the answer, you could possibly take it all the way up to the circuit level. District is local, circuit is state, and now you're going to take it up to the country, the Supreme Court. And once the Supreme Court has heard your case, if they're willing to hear it, you're done. Whatever the verdict was, that's it. You're done. You can't go anyplace else. So he figured that out. Another issue is what to do when common people don't like what's happening in their country and, and rebel. We are a country of rebellion at this time period. So the one, uh, the one rebellion that really changed everything for this country was the Whiskey Rebellion. And you could say it was Alexander Hamilton's fault. Hamilton came up with the idea of taxing people. He he had a huge debt to pay off. Um, Hamilton is the Secretary of Treasury and he's got to figure out how to pay off this debt that newly born America has. And so he decides to tax everything that you might call a sin. Um, and it becomes known as a sin tax. So you're talking gambling, um, um, alcohol, things like that are going to have a tax. It is not a big tax. It's a very small tax, but it is a tax. And you know how this country felt about taxes at the time. And so it's going to cause a big ruckus. And in Western Pennsylvania in 1794, right after the sin tax um, was issued, people decided that they were going to revolt in western Pennsylvania. Now, these are these are small farmers. They are subsistence farmers, which means they're growing enough food to feed their family, but they don't really have any um, leftover crops to make money for their family. So they're poor. And how do they make money? They make money by making whiskey, and they sell the whiskey. Well, now you're charging a tax on their whiskey. And so they think it's very unjust, and they start to rebel. And this is not like Shays Rebellion where all they had was pitchforks and um, they weren't well organized. This is pretty well organized and if you remember Shays Rebellion basically went all up and down the coast. It grew tremendously fast and George wanted to make sure that is not what happened with this Whiskey Rebellion. So he immediately caused 13,000 militia to go up and put out this fire and they do very quickly, very efficiently and the reason that this is so significant is it does for the very first time allow our federal government to flex its muscles and it shows the people of America that you can't just do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. You can't just say we're rebelling and go against the government. This is the last rebellion against the government in the United States and it makes it very very clear that people that are upset must use constitutional means to protest. They cannot just have an open rebellion that the federal government will not put up with that. This also shows everybody in the United States that the federal government is more powerful than the states. So George is just all over the place making first happen and come to life and really showing American citizens that this is a real honest-to-goodness government and if you don't like it tough we're here and we're not going anywhere so George is a George is a tough dude 
let's tear his uh, cabinet apart a little bit and look at some of the people serving in the cabinet. Um, and we're going to start with Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was the Secretary of Treasury, like I said before, and he is the guy basically responsible for creating the financial system that we have today. And when we became a nation, we were very highly in debt up to, uh, we were at $75 million. And you see what that converts to today. Um, he felt that we needed a very strong national government for everything basically but really to take care of this debt and so he is tasked with the idea of coming up with ways to to uh, raise money to get rid of the debt you see how it uh, worked with the syntax it was not popular it did work but you're not going to get 70 million, 75 million dollars off of syntaxes so he comes up with the idea that he would get the states to uh, basically pay their own debt and he's not going to say uh, Pennsylvania you owe this much so you got to pay it off and Rhode Island you owe this much he leveled the playing field and said here's how much the states owe and we're you're all going to pay it off together well so the states got mad and they said why should we pay off a debt that another state has for one thing if you're talking about uh, repairing damages because of the Revolutionary War there wasn't a lot of damage in the South. So why is the South being asked to pay off debts that the North accrued through damages and things like that? So they got very, very upset. And it's going to come down to Alexander Hamilton having to figure out how to get people to vote yes to this. So here's, here's the thing. Whenever you have a bill that you want to get through Congress, you do not have to push that bill all by itself. You can attach anything you want to it. So a good example would be the Obamacare bill. When Obamacare went through Congress, of course, the first time it went through, everybody said no. When it went through the second time, um, the, those in, in power added things that certain um, senators and legislative uh, leaders would be interested in. So I'm just going to give you a pretend example. Let's say uh, Rhode Island really wanted all the sidewalks in Rhode Island to be painted purple, but the federal government had always said no to that. So you could add that to the Obamacare bill. All the sidewalks are going to be painted purple. Well, are they really going to read the Obamacare bill or are they only going to look at, hey, we're getting purple sidewalks and sign off on the whole shebang? Well, that's what they did. They signed off on the whole shebang. By the time that the Obamacare bill made it all the way through Congress, it was, it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And most congressmen that were asked to be honest after it was over and asked, did you actually read the final version of the Obamacare plan, most of them admitted they did not because it was too much to read. After you added everybody's little uh, wish list uh, things to it, it was just too much to read. Well, that's what they're going to do here with this idea of the state assumption of debts. Um, there was a huge argument over where the capital should be. They had not settled that yet. And so, of course, the Northerners want it in the North, and the Southerners want it in the South. And so the Northerners are the ones that really need the help paying off these debts, not the Southerners. So Alexander Hamilton is a Northerner, and he goes to all his buddies in the North, and he says, look, you, your states need help paying this debt off, and the South is not willing to help you. So here's what we're going to do. We have to give them something. We're going to let them have the capital in the South, and in exchange, they are going to let us charge them to help pay for our debts. So the state assumption of debts, that, that thing that when it goes through Congress, they're going to attach the idea that you're going to get to have the capital in the South. And so the Southern senators and legislative people are going to say yes to it. So basically, it's kind of a bribe, which we do that all the time in Congress. So that's how he got them to agree to uh, assume the, the debts. Um, so that's one thing that he's not super popular about it or, or because of it, but he got it done. He's also the guy who created the National Bank and 20% of, of the money that was first deposited in the bank was, was federal funds. So the federal government is hugely vested in this bank. Um, this, is a, this is a huge, huge argument between Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, Jefferson did not believe that you should, 
that he was allowed to create a national bank and here's why. Jefferson truly believed in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. He believed that if it wasn't written in the Constitution that the federal government could create a national bank then they could not do it. Hamilton said you're an idiot. We can't know everything that's going to happen to this country and we cannot we can't run a country st strictly on what the Constitution says we can do. Sometimes Jefferson you got to read between the lines. You got to just do what needs to be done for the country and and um, kind of go around the Constitution. So I'm calling for a loose interpretation of the Constitution. So Jefferson and Hamilton really got into a huge argument over this. In the end, they're both going to quit their jobs. Jefferson is going to be Secretary of State. Hamilton is the Secretary of the Treasury. They are both going to quit their jobs over this because they can't work together. They just hate one another. Um, as a side note, you do not have to put this in, in your notes, but as a side note, this wasn't their first argument. They actually argued um, physically argued at a dinner where many of our founding fathers had gotten together to talk about where to put the White House and this is before Hamilton had made that deal about the state assumption of debts and so he's still saying I want it in the north Jefferson is saying I want it in the south and um, they're at this dinner at a round table and they got so heated that supposedly both of them jumped the table to go after the other one and they ended up fighting in the middle of the table and his uh, Alexander Hamilton's head ended up in the plate of George Washington in his mashed potatoes. So wouldn't you love to have been there for that? So they, their uh, history goes back further than just the interpretation of the Constitution. But this is their number one argument. Um, and, and again, make sure you know that both of them will quit their job over the idea of the strict versus loose interpretation of Constitution. Um, Hamilton also believed in the fact that the economy should be based on industry and um, he was he and men like him were supported most by bankers businessmen and Northeast and interest and um, let me give you a little bit of a background on Alexander Hamilton Alexander Hamilton was uh, raised by a uh, mother who who never married and so he was an illegitimate child in um, St. Croix wasn't even in the United States and um, his his mother being the fact that she was not married and pregnant got a very bad reputation and she was treated badly in St. Croix and so was Alexander Hamilton and his mother being poor uh, it meant that he grew up around poor people who were mean to him and he and his mother at one point both were very very ill and he recovered but his mom was not recovering and so he had knocked on all the neighborhood doors asking for help maybe a collection of money to get her medicine and they would not give him any money and his mother died so you can understand why he has this real chip on his shoulder about poor people he thinks all poor people are evil well his mother had a boss who uh, realized Alexander Hamilton was a really smart kid and so he kind of took Alexander under his wing and taught him you know how to read very accelerated books and taught him about business and finance and really really took care of this kid and and uh, not long after Alexander's mother died there was a hurricane that just devastated St. Croix and so they're all rebuilding and this man looked at at Alexander and said why should this child rebuild there's nothing here for him so he personally now this is a rich man went to local business owners and they collected funds to buy Alexander a ticket to America where he could go to college and really make something of himself so do you see that that Alexander Hamilton had a good experience with the wealthy people and a very bad experience with the poor people so he thinks poor people are evil and he thinks rich people are wonderful so of course he's going to kind of go with that group where the economy is based on the richer group the industry people I hope that makes sense to you so Alexander Hamilton um, um, just was raised in in an environment where it made him that kind of a guy now let's look at Thomas. Uh, like I said, Thomas and Alexander did not like each other and Thomas is Secretary of the State. So um, his big thing was separation of church and state. That does not mean he was an atheist. He was a very religious guy, but he did not believe in, in um, church and state ruling together. Now he 
exactly opposite of Alexander Hamilton, wanted a very weak national government and wanted the states to be strong. He hated the idea of that national bank. He said it was unconstitutional because it was not specifically written in the Constitution. And again, don't forget, he wanted a strict interpretation of that Constitution, like verbatim. It doesn't say it in there. We can't do it. And again, completely opposite of Alexander Hamilton, he wants the economy to be based on agriculture and he's going to be supported by the poorer people, the farmers, the artisans, the frontier set settlers. These are the people that will back him up. So our first party system, um, you've heard of these guys before, is really going to be the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. So remember when they were trying to get the Constitution ratified, it was the Federalists that said the Constitution is great just like it is, let's let's sign off on it and move forward. And a group called the Anti-Federalists said we're not signing off on this until we get a Bill of Rights. So here you have the first faction that is going to develop. When they become true honest to goodness uh, political parties, they will be the Federalist uh, merchants, bankers, you see all the people involved here, loose interpretation of the Constitution versus the Democratic Republicans. They didn't want to keep the name Anti-Federalist because it sounds negative. Um, and they don't want to start a party with a negative connotation. So, um, And they're not total opposites either. So if you've got Federalist versus Anti-Federalist, it sounds like they're completely opposite. And they're not completely. So our first real political parties is the Federalist versus the Democratic Republicans. And here's where you get Hamilton versus Jefferson so they are always at each other's throats and please 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 for the hundredth time remember that Jefferson and Hamilton both left their post over the interpretation of the Constitution with uh, Hamilton saying loose interpretation and Jefferson saying strict so let's get back to what George is dealing with. Um, besides his Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of State hating one another and getting into fist fights and uh, the Whiskey Rebellion and all these other things here at home, he's got to deal with foreign countries too. Um, so we're going to start with France. Now remember, France is our big time buddy. They met us at Yorktown, surrounded Cornwallis. We won the revolution because of them. You would think that we would be best friends. And at the time, we were. Um, and when the French Revolution began, we were all gung-ho to, you know, be on their side and support them. Now, we're not going to support them with money or troops like they did us, of course. Ha, <laughs> don't be silly. But we were saying that we were their friend and we were going to back them up. That whole thing started with the alliance created in 1778. Uh, let's be buddies. But here's the problem. See this guy here? His name is Ro Maximilian Robespierre. And if you remember the Reign of Terror from uh, your earlier history classes, the Reign of Terror is where Robespierre went nuts and started killing basically anyone that looked at him cross-eyed. And so he gets a reputation for being a crazy man. Well, we don't want to be associated with that. So America in 1793, rather than saying, hey, let's go help them and let's send money and let's send men, which we wouldn't have anyway. <laughs> uh, he, we also said, we're not even going to take a side here. We're going to remain neutral. But we're still your friends. We still love you. If you need us in the future, give us a call. But right now, mm, no, we're out. 1793. So it is again because of Robespierre. We don't want to be associated with that kind of lunacy, but we really did betray the country that helped us win our own revolution. So America's not always the best friend of other nations. And what about good old England, our old mother? Uh, there are still some issues. The revolution is over, but of course they're not going to go away completely and, and be quiet and never bother us again. There were still forts, uh, mostly in the northwestern areas of the United States, and uh, we were uh, not thrilled about the forts being there at all. We wanted the British to burn them, but empty forts would have been bad enough, but some of the forts still had British officers in them uh, guarding the forts. Uh, they also were selling weapons to Indians and encouraging the Indians to shoot the colonists. Um, you know, hey, if you shoot enough colonists, we'll give you goodies and maybe we can get them out of America and you can have your land back. Empty promises, things like that. But the thing I think that upset them the most was the idea of impressment. 
the British government um, was allowing ships, British ships, to take uh, take over American ships, actually jump on board them and take the men on board as um, hostages and turn them into British uh, Navy guys. So they're impressing them by they're they're capturing them and turning them into British sailors against their will. So that was a huge thing that we were upset about. There was also money that the British owed us and we owed them and nobody's paying anybody. And so that's going to be another argument between us and them. They're saying you owe us this and we're saying you owe us that. And so this is another huge argument. So there's other things too, but these are the four you need to know. The forts, the Indians, the impressment, and the unpaid loans. Now we don't want another war with England, so we end up ended up um, creating a treaty called Jay's Treaty. It was uh, written by John Jay, and you're going to meet him again in the future. Um, but in 1794, he wrote Jay's Treaty, and in that treaty, you can see the British agreed to evacuate the forts, but they don't mention anything about the Indians. They don't mention anything about um, paying us, and they don't mention anything about impressment. They only agreed to evacuate the forts and to burn them down on their way out the door. Now the Americans agreed to pay their pre-war debts. So you've got only two, you've got all these issues, but the only two that are approached at all in this treaty is the forts and the pre-war debt that we supposedly owe to the British, which <laughs> of course we're never going to pay that. Uh, don't be silly. Um, but it was very unpopular with Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. They said this was not enough. Uh, why didn't you press for the other things like the impressment and the Indians and the money they owe us? And of course the Federalists are going to say, look, we, we're just trying to make everybody happy here and of course it's not really going to solve anything but it is 1794 and it is going to put the approaching war off until 1812 the war of 1812 um, so it did work for a little while but maybe maybe if they had listened to Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans maybe there would not have been a war in 1812 who knows but Jay's treaty settled things for a little while um, and then they're all going to come back to bite them in the in the behind in 1812 so make sure you know it is not Jay's treaty is not a permanent solution and believe it or not we're having problems with Spain too um, the boundary line, especially for the Mississippi River, is an issue. Uh, if you look at the map here, don't forget that we were given we were given um, the right of way on the Mississippi River. But here's a problem: if you look at the map, look who is in control of the mouth of the Mississippi down in New Orleans, and that would be the Spanish. So they were not allowing us to use those ports there was also there were also warehouses there that America needed to store goods so that the boats could travel up and down the Mississippi and come back for more goods out of the warehouses but the Spanish are saying you can't use the warehouses and you can't use the mouth of the Mississippi you're gonna have to go further up the river to get on the water there and it was messing with our trade and so we don't want a war with Spain Spain doesn't want a war with us and so in 1795 another man which you're going to meet again named Pickney was asked to make a treaty and this was a treaty of friendship basically uh, between the U.S. and Spain uh, we considered it a victory um, but we I mean we didn't really win this great giant thing but it, it settled Spain and it kind of settled the idea of of allowing us to use the Mississippi River um, so basically we got our way and you know America loves that so it allowed for us to have the free have free navigation of all of the Mississippi River including the mouth so that we could come down to Louisiana and get on the Mississippi River there and it also allowed us to um, use those warehouses now what did Spain get they didn't get nothing they got nothing so it really was just a treaty of friendship for Spain to say, okay, we'll be your friend, you, you naughty little child who won't stop crying if you don't get your way. And America said, thank you very much. And that's the end of that. So was it a great victory? Maybe for America. Uh, but Spain didn't get anything out of it except they got to be our friend. And of course, everybody wants to be our friend. So I guess they thought they were winners too. Who knows? 
So at 1796, George has already made it clear that he is not going to uh, be president again. And so we have to have an election. The election of 1796 saw John Adams, who was a Federalist. He was also the vice president to George uh, versus Thomas Jefferson, a Democratic Republican. So in the election of 1796, John Adams is going to win. And back then, whoever um, got the most votes became president and the second number of votes became vice president regardless of political party so you have um, john adams as the president as if he's a federalist again and thomas jefferson will be his vice president but he's a democratic republican now later we're going to change that we're going to create the 12th amendment that says that you um, when you run you either have to run for presidency or for the presidency or the vice presidency we're not doing this you know the second highest number becomes vice president because you don't want two different political guys in charge you want them to be um, of the same party so that took care of that with the 12th amendment so Adams I'm not gonna lie is not my favorite president um, I'm gonna try though not to uh, sway you maybe you're gonna think he's wonderful so let's just look at some of the things he did um, and this thing I'm about to tell you about really did kind of make him look like a hero and then he screws it up uh, with the thing I'm gonna show you on the next slide so anyway let's start with this one um, it goes down to history as the XYZ affair and the quasi war so here's what happens uh, the French are really mad at us okay because we we decided that we were not going to help them in their own revolution again remember uh, we helped they helped us and then we wouldn't help them so they're mad at us so Adams decides to send three men Charles Pickney you know him with the Spanish guy uh, Treaty of Friendship um, Elbr Elbridge what a name Jerry and John Marshall you're gonna hear his name again he sends these three men kind of in secret um, to go and approach the foreign minister Talleyrand the French foreign minister Talleyrand that was his name so when they arrive um, in France and they approach Talleyrand he he doesn't meet with them he gives them a message that if they bring him money he will agree to meet with them well that's bribery and that's illegal so these guys don't know what to do they can't bribe him um, they want to get the job done but they can't bribe him so they come back home and they tell Adams hey this you know Talleyrand wouldn't even see us he asked us to bribe him so these four men sit down together and they're kind of playing a what if game and they decide that Talleyrand could very well turn it around on America and say America tried to bribe him instead of the truth and the truth was he asked for a bribe so America doesn't want this to get out of hand they don't want you know a new America here there were still very young and very fragile we don't want the American people or Congress getting mad at these four guys so Adams create Adam writes a, Adams writes a document explaining exactly what happened to Congress now he doesn't want to use the names Pickney Jerry and Marshall because he doesn't want it to hurt their political careers and you know how propaganda gets out of control and the good guy suddenly saying it seems like the bad guy so in order to protect these three men when he writes the report to Congress about what happened with Talleyrand he doesn't use their names he calls them Mr. X Mr y and mr z so that that becomes known as the xyz affair the xyz affair is Talleyrand asking them for a bribe so congress reads the document reads the story of what happened the fact that Talleyrand asked for a bribe congress gets really ticked off so they order the building of our very first navy and they go after the french so the french totally did not expect this at all uh, when America shows up with these warships really basically nothing is going to happen we kind of had to have a staring match there's no war declared and Adams visits them in 1800 visits visits France in 1800 they hold a convention and basically he he walks away with a handshake and everything is settled so it's not really a war um, that's why we call it a quasi war so XYZ affair led to the quasi war Adams is given credit for settling it before it becomes an actual war and so he is the hero of the day at the convention of 1800 so 
I don't know that he did anything fancy enough or wonderful enough to call him a hero, but you decide. Maybe you think differently. But let's see what else he did on the next slide. We're going to go back in time a little bit. Uh, it's 1799 and a new election is on the horizon and Adams knows that he's not always been the favorite president of everybody and um, they he also knows that Thomas Jefferson is pretty well liked. He's especially well liked by people who are pro-French uh, because it was Thomas Jefferson's group that really encouraged the French to revolt against their evil leadership. Um, so he, he's worried. Adams is worried that he may not get the votes enough to become president. So he creates something called the Alien Act. And basically, if you're seeking citizenship in the United States, he has made it so that it could last anywhere from 5 to 15 years, which means it's way past the time that Jefferson could use your votes for this election. And 5 to 15 means that you, if Jefferson and Adams went against each other in the next election, you wouldn't even have your citizenship to vote for him. He was also allowed to deport anybody he considered dangerous. Um, so if you already had your citizenship or you were very near getting your citizenship, then he could just have you deported. So basically it was a way for him to uh, cut out some of the votes that Jefferson would have or possibly would have gotten. He also created the Sedition Act. And the Sedition Act meant that you were not allowed to speak badly of the president or the government in general. So if you've got a, um, a, a newspaper that was very pro-Jefferson, they might say something bad against Adams, trying to convince people that Jefferson was the, was the better man, but now they can't. So the Alien and Sedition Acts are both targeted at allowing Adams to win this next election. See, I just think that's sneaky and icky. So I just didn't I just don't think that he was the greatest man ever. And he's going to do some other stuff too. So let's keep let's keep uh, telling his story and again you can make up your mind, but I'm pretty sure you're you're going to agree with me that he wasn't a great guy. So we get to the election of 1800 and there's a big surprise. Um, there are actually four men running. Okay, you don't have to know. You don't have to know the fourth guy, but I'm going to give you three of them. You got Adams uh, running on the Federalist ticket, and a, and another guy running on the Federalist ticket. I can't think of his name, but you don't need to know it anyway. Um, on the Democratic Republican ticket, you have Jefferson and Aaron Burr. So all four are, are running for president, and people are really thinking this contest is going to come down to Adams versus Jefferson. Well, it does not. It actually comes down to an absolute tie with Jefferson and Aaron Burr both in the lead with the exact same votes. So it's a tie. So we already know that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton do not like one another. But I'm going to give you another story here. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton do not like each other. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton had met years before. Um, they were both really young when they met. And Aaron Burr was a little more um, polished in politics. And Alexander Hamilton thought he was just wonderful. He followed Aaron Burr around like a puppy trying to learn from him. And I guess Aaron Burr, I don't know if he got creeped out or maybe he just didn't like Alexander Hamilton, but he um, he finally kind of started getting nasty with, with Hamilton. And they were all at a dinner one evening and Aaron Burr and Hamilton were in this little group of men and they were all talking and Hamilton said something and Aaron Burr turned to him in front of all, all their peers now and said, please stop talking. You don't know anything and you talk too much so he basically blew Hamilton out of the water and Hamilton was never going to forgive him for that now a few years later Hamilton's father-in-law was running for a senate seat and Aaron Burr beat him out for that beat the father-in-law out so these two men have a little bit of history. So here, let's go back to Jefferson and Aaron Burr. When it ties like that, the House of Representatives is asked to break the tie. So Alexander Hamilton looks at these two men, the two men that he hates, Jefferson and Aaron Burr, and he has to make a decision about which one he hates the most. And he decides he hates Aaron Burr the most. So he goes through the House of Representatives and convinces people to vote for Jefferson. 
And of course, you can't do that in a vacuum. People knew what he was doing, including Jefferson and Aaron Burr. So of course, Jefferson encouraged it. Aaron Burr just kept getting madder and madder about it. And finally, when the House of Representatives voted, guess who wins the presidency? Jefferson. So Aaron Burr uh, was pretty ticked off about it. But that's not why Aaron Burr and Hamilton are going to get into a, a, a duel. Aaron Burr, he, he found out he wasn't going to be president, okay? But he had already made some uh, plans where he was going to run for the governor of New York. And he really thought that he would be able to get this position so even if he's not president as mad as he's going to be it's okay because he'll be the governor of new york he's not going to be out of politics um but alexander hamilton found out about this plan and hamilton goes to new york and he talks to all his friends there and guess what aaron burr is not going to be the governor of new york either so when aaron burr finds out what hamilton did He's already not going to be president. Now he's not going to be governor. This is when Aaron Burr challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel. So they're they're going to do it on a little island. And a, a little side note here: um, Alexander Hamilton's eldest son uh, was named Philip. Philip um, was in politics, and for almost a year to the day. Philip had challenged another man to a duel at the exact same place, almost the exact same day, and Philip, Hamilton's eldest son, dies in the in the duel. So here's a year later, same place, same kind of situation. Uh, Hamilton doesn't really go there planning on killing Aaron Burr. Hamilton was actually a really good shot, and so was his son Philip. And they, um, Hamilton was going to this this duel with the idea that he would absolutely be able to shoot first but he was going to shoot over Aaron Burr's head. Aaron Burr was not a good shot and Hamilton was banking on the fact that Aaron Burr would miss and so you know if nobody shoots anybody the duel is over you only get the one shot and then both men would go home the anger would dissipate and they would you know be back at each other's throat another day but alive. That was the plan. So Alexander Hamilton does that. He gets off the first shot. He purposely shoots over Aaron Burr's head. Aaron Burr shoots, and lo and behold, he shot Hamilton right in the heart and killed him. So it was it. Aaron Burr meant to hurt him, but it it really was a a shot of fate that Aaron Burr actually hit him in the heart. Um, side note too, going back to Alexander Hamilton, same exact thing. Hamilton told his son Philip, "Don't really hurt the guy, you know, just do it for a show." And Philip did exactly the same thing. And Philip wasn't shot in the heart; he was shot in the groin area. Uh, the one arm was behind his back and so it went through his groin and hit the main artery in his groin and then it went through his wrist and hit the main artery there and the boy bled out you know in record time because it had hit two arteries just coincidence so Hamilton and his eldest son Philip both killed in duels Aaron Burr of course is never going to recover politically he is tried eventually but he's tried for treason not for the murder of Hamilton uh, he goes he's not found guilty he goes to Europe for a while kind of you know fiddles around there doesn't make anything of himself and comes back here and dies pretty much a loner unknown uncared about in New York and so this duel really did destroy his political career so anyway now we have the president um, it's going to be Jefferson and this is the first time that a new political party is going to be in control of the nation and the whole world is holding its breath waiting to see what happens and so they call it the revolution of 1800 because it is a change in the in our political system a major change and so change revolution equals change was it a revolution there was no blood loss nobody even got really upset except for Adams and I'll tell you more about that in a minute but we completely changed political parties and nothing happened it was very peaceful the power the transfer of power you know went without a hiccup and it showed the world really truly that we were very united as a country and again after this we've got that 12th amendment where you have to decide what position you're running for on the ticket whether you're going to be the president or the vice president so um, one we're going to talk about one more thing and this is um, Jefferson coming in as Adams is leaving so hold your horses here we go 
So Adams is pretty ticked off that Jefferson won. I'm sure he was even more ticked off at the fact that he wasn't even in the running, that it would be Jefferson and Burr that that were the guys that had to have the tie broken between them. But Adams is really ticked off, and he's not going to go away quietly. So I don't know if you know this, but it's a tradition of presidents that as they're leaving, they kind of do things to play a trick on the president coming in. Um, and one of the things, and I can't remember which president did this, but one of the things that um, a more modern president did is he had somebody go through and wipe all the keys uh, the the letters off the keys on all the computers in the White House, so you wouldn't know, you know, what key was what, which I think is hilarious. Now Adams did do some jokey things like that, like he had all the doorknobs in the entire White House removed. He also had the bathroom, which was an indoor outhouse, really. He had it boarded shut little things like that but he also did some things that was a, a lot more serious now he has until midnight um, when he's not president anymore so he can still do some presidential things and he decides that he is going to fill as many federal positions as he can with federalist before his time runs out and so he's writing these letters to people um, up and down the coast basically giving them these positions and some of them were judges some of them were postmasters um, you know they were different positions but they're federal positions and so he's filling out all of these letters and um, you know at midnight he's done he can't do any more and he hands them off to his uh, secretary of state and says make sure that they are make sure that they do get in the mail well the secretary of state under adams gets some of them in the mail but he didn't have time to get all of them sealed and sent out and so the next morning here comes uh the new president jefferson and his secretary of state matt james madison and so james madison and jefferson asked the old secretary of state hey what do you got there and of course he had to show it to him and madison says you're not delivering anymore and of course jefferson agreed with him you're not delivering anymore so jefferson and madison together say no no more of these appointment letters are allowed to go out well there was one guy by the name of um marbury and marbury had already been promised that he was going to be given the position of the justice of the peace and he already knew this in, a, in advance but now his letter was one of them that was confiscated by Jefferson and Madison so he's not going to be the justice of the peace well he decides to sue well you can't sue the president you're not allowed to so it's got to go under the name Madison so the case name becomes Marbury the guy who was supposed to get the position versus Madison the Secretary of State so he's suing trying to get this position now the chief justice was john marshall remember him xyz john marshall was uh probably one of the best supreme court judges we've we've had he was one of those judges that uh you couldn't you didn't know which way he was going to go you couldn't look at him and say he's a federalist he's going to vote this way or he's a democratic republican he's definitely going to vote this way you really couldn't do that and this is one of those cases where he wanted to make it very clear that every judge needed to read all the documents associated with this case marbury versus madison and based on nothing more than the material that they had in front of them you know all the the evidence that they had in front of them they needed to make the decision on this court on this court case now reviewing all the evidence and making your your decision based on that is known as judicial review and it is John Marshall who is the one who comes up with this and it's the Marbury versus Madison case where this happens and so the judges all use judicial review on Marbury versus Madison and of course they end up giving Marbury the position because he was promised it, he was given it, the letter was written before Adams was no longer the president and so to be fair Marbury had to be allowed to take the position. So uh, Chief Justice John Marshall Judicial Review Marbury versus Madison first time ever that that the judicial branch shows how much power it really has because they actually went against the current president of the United States so they're you know they, they did what was the right thing according to the 
everything that they presented all the evidence in front of them and again that's judicial review and now the judges are supposed to do that with every case that comes before them regardless of who's involved in the case they use the idea of judicial review and and make their decision based on that all right so that was a ton of information and not a lot of time uh, hopefully you stayed with me and got something out of it and I will see you in the next unit